I, I, I don't have any specific slides for uh, this particular class, but uh, I figured I could use some of the stuff I got <laughs> already stored. Anyway, so what did I learn basically over these days? And then in that last session where you and Duke were arguing about how I should trade, um, patience was the biggest thing. What a willy-nilly trait is not. Number one is patience, waiting for the high yeah. probabilities. In order for a trader to wait for the high probability, they have to ask, well, what is a high probability trade? To that trader internally. Um, so to do that, we have to identify the, the structure of a higher time frame and possibly a lower time frame. We map out the high and we map out the low on that chart. And for some of us, we put a middle line in. Those folks that would like to use a Bollinger Band or a Kelch Channel or an alligator, the middle middle band has the middle line has some real uh, value. Well, I don't do that. I like the high and the low and trade in between. Um, and then, of course, where is price in that structure? Is it closer to the high or closer to the low? Which way is it going? If we look on the daily chart, and most folks are you know trying that. to go are ahead. Are you showing? Are you showing your chart, or are you? Oh, I well, I I don't really have a chart to show, but oh, I just didn't know if you were talking about something you were showing. Okay, no, uh, it's just, okay, uh, gotcha. I'll get to this. So if okay, we mapped yeah. out the high, and mapped out the low, mapped out the middle, we got three ways the price can be skewed. Obviously, it can be bullish, it can go sideways, or it can go south. We need to know that. You want to do me a favor, Ed, and rotate that image so we can read it? Well, I put it that way because, you know, price doesn't go. Um, it doesn't go up. How's that? Yeah, now we can read it. <clears throat> so the, the real thing, I didn't care about reading it, but the real thing is the uh, where can price go? which is why I had it sideways because like price wouldn't go like this. Um, so anyway, where, where are we in that price? Now for me, in my type of trading, I want to be here and heading south. Or I want to be here and heading north. Uh, however, most of the time, the market is actually going sideways. Of course, that depends a little on the time frame that you're looking at. But once we decide this, and I would pick uh, uh, which way it's going, uh, I use the percentage of change and the one hour chart and say, which way is it going? And I'll trade that on a lower time frame, say the five or the 15 minute um, price cycles. I do that obviously a lot of times using my this is an SMI indicator, but you could use a CCI or a stochastic or um, any number of oscillators to help identify that in the early stages of your learning. I've been trading a couple of times now without my indicators at all. Um, that's been an experience. Um, today, in case nobody knows, I had my best day ever, by the way. Um, I Maybe did notice that. I did see see you post something in there. I didn't. You didn't. I think I thought you said you did. Wasn't your best day ever on the post? But it, no, no. But did it That's turn? I posted it in that best day ever section. I made almost fourteen yeah. percent on that trade. Um, yeah, okay. I'm a... Overall, I made about eighteen percent. Awesome. So anyway, we planned the trade. Awesome. Um. To, 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 I, I trade in the direction of the, which way the price is going as much as possible. That's defined as a trend trader. Um, when we decide where we're at in the structure, for instance, if I were here in the middle, I would not be taking a trade because why? I don't know if it's going to go north or it's going to go south. I had to wait for the market to tell me. Um, once we decide all that, the next thing we have to decide is our sizing. Uh, how much money can we risk? Not how much money can we make. If 
but how much can we risk? On a uh, $100,000 account, we might want to risk a point, point 0.5, half a lot. We might even get brave and go on a whole lot. This morning, after we got done trading, I got brave and went on with Brandon candles, two and a half lots. That's how I made 14%. Uh, oh, with, with the trend. Uh, so once we get past the sizing and our, our, our which way the market's going to go, we got to sort of, where's our entry point? Well, if I'm up here, or if I take, if I take this chart, and say I'm up here crossing this particular line, or this line in this case, well, I want to enter the trade because I'm heading south, even though the direction for tonight on the gold is actually bullish. This particular cycle bias is southern, is south. It's south because why? The 15-minute chart is pushing it down. But the one-hour chart has just barely turned, and it hasn't crossed the 40 line yet, which is kind of like my witching hour line. Um, so I would use that, but it also I would see here the high and the low. Where is price between that? Price is heading. Oh, God, I don't know where that came from. Here we go. So where is price between the high and the low? It's relatively high here. I know there's going to be pressure because the overall trend is bullish, but it still needs to come down to complete its cycle. Um, okay. Any questions? Uh, so what else I do I need? Turn that. Pardon me? Can you turn that picture? Again? Okay. Like, make it right side up? Sure. How's that? No. <laughs> there you go. All right. That's, that's just one of them. Let me see. Here's another one. This is one that Kevin has. And I copied it out of his little workbook. It kind of gives us the idea of the price cycles and the market pressure. Now, if I turn this on its side, did everybody get a chance to read it? Standard deviation down here, bell curve. But as price breaks out, it can go one, two, three, four, rarely five, but it does sometimes get out there, deviations or price cycles, as David likes to call them. And they are price cycles. Um, that's, that's how I learned to look at this a long time ago in terms of standard deviation. Now, when we're planning a trade, we don't want to just plan on the entry point. We want to plan on the exit also. Um, how much can I afford to risk? Well, how many lots can I risk? How much money can I risk? On a $100,000 account, I'm willing to risk $1,000, sometimes $2,000, depending on how the trade looks. That'd be a couple lots. In TVC, you can draw that uh, if we can find the right one. Here we go. I could actually draw it. If I can get it to work. And plan my trade out for both the risk, if it was a case of a loss, or the winner. In this case, the reward ratio was almost five to one. Yeah, that's that's acceptable to me. Um, and of course, in TVC, you can look at it. How does that look from the one minute to the five to the 15? The 15, you can barely see it. Um, but we gotta remember the market's fractal. Um, so it's like taking a bunch of little Russian dolls outside of one another, bing, 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 bing. Um, so if I had gotten in up here, um, that would have been great because I'm already halfway to profit. Of course, this is just an example. So the, the important part of that little discussion there is how much am I willing to risk and where am I going to place my stop so that I have my trade planned out in advance 
unlike a willy-nilly trade, you wouldn't do that. You say, oh, that looks good. Let's hit enter, um, which I've been known to do from time to time for sure. Um, and then you got your plan, your A, your B, and your C. I don't usually have a B, um, except unless it's uh, to wait and then continue. Uh, but I do have a C where I'll just stop everything and get out, take a break. And that would be my exit or my exit course at profit. Or uh, sometimes I'll exit at a, just a plain stall point. Um, so a lot of us may not be consistently profitable yet. Why is that? Are we taking too many nilly, willy nilly trades? Or are we doing naive practice as opposed to deliberate practice? In other words, how serious are we um, to trade? Sometimes we can be overly serious and be too scared or too much pressure. Um, now, I, I myself, at the end of every day, I will plot my trades, which many of you have seen me post. I will also record my stats in a spreadsheet. Um, I posted today's little portion of it today. Um, I'll sometimes do a journal, what happened to my head during the trade. I don't focus a lot on my negative trades, on my losers. It's just, well, I could have done that better, I could have done that better, and I move on. But I do focus a lot on my winners. What did I do right? Or what went right? How did the market bless me? Was I prepared to take a giant win? Today, in my uh, Darwin account, and I can pull that up here. And come on up. Um, say in my Darwin account, and this is it here. I said we made about one and a quarter percent, but if you look, I got out here. And the market kept on going. So I, I threw away, I left a lot on the table. But I would get out, I was profitable, I was happy and okay with that. But I will look back and say, well, I could have done better because it had this whole bucket or canyon, whatever you want to call it, to fill. And I didn't wait for it to happen. Um, I had a hard time getting there, as you may say, so I was a little anxious to get out of my trading. Um, so you do those, you do those things like plot your trades, do your stats, maybe a journal. Um, I'm not big on writing, so I don't do a lot of written journal. I do keep a little scratch paper on my desk all the time where I write notes to myself. Then I throw them out in a day or so after I review them. Um, and then what do you do? You analyze, you adjust, and you rinse and repeat. You do it again. And that's about all I got to say, David. So let's back up to a little bit about you told me in boot camp, and I'd love for you to share with everybody. How was your tra trading change from six months ago to where it is today? What are the things that you have implemented that you feel like are good um, changes? Because I've seen it. I've seen I've seen a, a complete um, change in your trading, and what caused it. What is it, and and how can it help other people who are here? Well, I used to have a contest with Duke, <laughs> not a formal contest. We just we 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 would place a lot of trades, and I went to the point where I asked Duke what mouse he was using so I could get a machine gun mouse like he had. <laughs> I didn't buy one, by the way. Um, still using my same old piece of garbage, but. You know, it used to be that, you know, putting 100 trades on was not an issue. Uh, right. By the time I got to 100, I'd be asking, I wonder if the market's going to be right or I'm going to be right. Well, I don't do that anymore. I trade the position, like I tried to just point out, um, in setting up the trade. And I also trade a higher lot size. I'm trading a 0.5 most of the time. Um, although I am experimenting with a one lot and a two lots a lot now in my uh, sandboxes. Um, 
And then as long as you got more or less high probability trades, a pretty good push to the direction. Trading with a higher lot size is really, really fun because uh, the money builds up fast. So, but I, I, I had a change of heart, I guess, um, to trade with a higher lot size and put on fewer trades. And as some people here keep harping on me to make better high probability trades, I will not mention any names, David. Um, <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I learned that with a higher probability trade, I can get away with a higher lot size and I don't need as many trades. Absolutely. Um, which makes it uh, a whole lot more convenient on my stress level. Uh, it sort of goes away. Uh, and, I, and I like that aspect. And what uh, are the um, what are the key you mentioned? And I, and I might have been a little bit too general, but you mentioned um, how you kind of. And maybe maybe it's part of the willy nilly trading that do you feel like, um, you know, six months ago, you might have had more willy nilly trading than than. Uh, setting up. Do you know what I mean? Then then look then look at then hunting for setups. Um, yeah, I hunt for the setups now. Um, absolutely. Um, this this turtle here is a good example. I slow down. Mm -hmm. Not in such a hurry anymore. Yep. Um, a lot of that is actually your fault, David, and, and trade the fund. Um, because at the same time, a few months back, we started looking for a quarter of a percent. Well, a quarter of a percent, if you're trading at 0.5 or, or one lot, <laughs> stack your fingers and you made a quarter of a percent. So right, right. I slow down and, and I look for the higher probability trade. Um, one of the reasons that I use um, my stochastic index is it has um, these these I put the lines here on at sixties, but generally it's the line is forty, um, and I wait for it to cross that line. I just wait. Okay, it's proved the trend to me now. Um, I have a trade on. I have no clue what it's doing. Um, I guess I'm plus a little bit. Um, uh, I did hit 10% here earlier, but I gave it all back because I was porting around. Waiting for class to start. <laughs> um, um, so what are, the, what are some of the things that um, we talked about what are the main takeaways from the boot camp that we did with you last week? What would you um, say? Your three. Let me get my, my three, three Let me get my three pages of notes here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, three R's is one, but with no. patience. Um, and that's of course after you plan the trade out. Mm -hmm. um, patience is I and waiting for your. Entry point. Yeah, because I was just going to say, I mean, patience is a is a very vague word that a lot of people will say. Um, how do you, how do you, what does patience look to you? Like if you could describe it to a trader, what are, what do you mean by patience? Explain that in a little bit more detail, right? Well, if you under, if a trader has an idea of what their ideal trade is, what, what, what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, on my screen here, my ideal trade would be <laughs> if we're at the bottom and heading to the top, which we are, that would be a good entry. Mm -hmm. So, and I would say over here, okay, well, this guy here is probably not in the best position, however, <sighs> this is pretty top heavy. So I would suspect that it's going to come down. That's why there's all these cells here. Um, but I don't know that. So patience is for me is waiting for the market to tell me what it wants to do, and not me tell it what I want to do. And one of the things that I've always said that that's probably, you know, one of your weaknesses in trading, and everybody has them, is that 
you're just impatient. And I'm that's one of my weaknesses as well, is I just get impatient, right? Well, yeah, I want to go on with the show. Yeah, yeah. You just I don't want to wait. Um and uh give me my give me my goal, you know. I don't want to wait. Um, one of the things that helped me was your beginning game, mid game, and end game. Mm-hmm. Um beginning, middle, and it and late. Yeah. Yeah. And late game. Well, yeah. <laughs> Late or end, as the case may be. Um, in Darwin, um, trading it a half a lot. I mean, you can't put 20 trades on. Nope. <laughs> 15 is it. So if I use 10 trades as my <clears throat> three, you know, beginning, middle, and end, or late, um, that leaves five for fix it. Um, and that slows me down. Gee, I can only get three trades on here in the beginning. I better make sure they're good three trades. And not just slacked in any old place. Oh, I'll fix it later. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say we we saw that transformation in you at the, the boot camp because um, you know, it the the first day or the previous week we actually were trading with you and i said you know what your your biggest problem is not a big problem it just needs to be cleaned up and that's just waiting for the better price right exactly. and it's just waiting for the better price and that's that's what i wanted um you to, you to have your aha moment with was patience for you means waiting for the better price right being patient and confident that the market will give you that better price as opposed to attacking it at the wrong times. Right. Yeah. When, I, yeah. I'd say 90% of the time when a trader such as myself enters into bad PTP, mm -hmm. and I don't mean just at the end of a price cycle, um, it's timing. It's waiting patiently waiting for the right moment to enter no matter what time mm -hmm. frame you're trading on it. Absolutely. And you're, um, uh, and I love how you started this conversation with willy nilly trading. Um, for those of you guys who don't know what willy nilly trading is just basically throwing trades on and seeing what sticks, right? That's, that's it. Yeah. It's like seeing, seeing which ones work out. And, hey, and, stop talking about. Um, <laughs> and you just, you, that's, that's just not a good long-term strategy. It really isn't right. You have to understand where the market's going, how it's getting there, and then wait for the premium price to maximize or reduce your risk. Maximize either you're either maximizing your return or you're reducing your risk by just waiting for the better price. And that's all there is to it. It's as easy as that, right? And that's what we've been working with Ed on in his boot camp was just waiting for the better price. And to his testament, um, and to my excitement and surprise, um, he was able to do that quite a bit um, during during his session. And um, I, I'll let you explain this, but you did tell me um, during boot camp that Darwin has helped you to become a better trader. And I'd love it if you could share your thoughts to everybody, what you shared with me and how you became a better trader because of because of Darwin, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the uh, let me let me go there. So this was a brand new account. We had an unfortunate accident earlier in the week with Anubis, and I had to get a new account. But uh, Khalid has fixed Anubis. Unfortunately, he couldn't fix my account. Um, <clears throat> this max drawdown here, as opposed to your return, if you if we look, we get these emails from uh, Darwin all the time. And like, here's one today. I may, maybe it was yesterday. Um, most of the time, these traders that they highlight, uh, I think this one had the lowest 
draw down. This guy's been around a while. He's only got three letters. Um, now he had uh, out of this week's three that they highlighted. <clears throat> this guy has the lowest max drawdown, nine point nine four. A lot of us would look at that, but you got to remember that drawdown is over the period of six months. So during that time, and however they manipulate it, he's actually earning several times ratio. Um, what's nine times eight or nine times nine times nine is eighty one? He's earning eight times ratio. Uh, eight to one. That's a pretty good earnings ratio. People would want to fund this guy. Mm -hmm. um, or mine. Well, that's kind of arbitrary. <laughs> um, well, you're also, you don't have six months of history either. Right? So No, um, but I do, it's a, you know, I, it's a, it, it is a new account. And so right. it's only 13% completed. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully I'm not going to have, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to strive to keep this max drawdown under 2% and keep my return going up so that I look a little more favorably to get funded. And that's how drawdown, that's how Darwin has helped me because I keep <clears throat> look at this uh, at the end of every day and say, hmm, uh, if it gets out of hand, you know, 6 7%, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of <clears throat> you need to make consistently more. And this is how it works over time. You need to keep it consistent if you're earning half a percent or whatever it is a day, half a percent, one percent, whatever that amount is. Eventually, you have to be consistent enough that that return is larger in two, three, four times larger than your max drawdown. The better that ratio is, the better you're going to get funded. That's right. And then that may not be how they advertise it, but that's exactly what I see. Right. Uh, if we look and so, at so when you notice that and recognize that, what shift did you make to your trading? Um, well, let me use this for an example here. I put all these trades on before class, hoping that price might come down by then. Uh, obviously, it hasn't. Um, but still, my drawdown, what is my drawdown here? It's not too bad. Uh, 500 bucks out of 100,000. That, that's pretty good. It's only half a percent. Mm -hmm. um, I keep an eye on that drawdown and make sure by the time I get to 1%, I'm already looking for a way out of my trades or how to fix it. And that honestly, for those of you guys who haven't, seen ed trade um we talked a little bit about his his weaknesses by being impatient and needing to work on patience but his strengths are he has the ability to cut his trades if and if they're not working out he he does not let his losers run right no and so and here it just went my way boom i hit out i could have stayed in it's got at least that far to go the other thing that david was stressed on me which i'm really bad at is securing my trades Mm -hmm. um, which I just proved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I apologize, Dave. That's okay. I won't. I'll, I'll uh, have nightmares about it tonight. So yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> it's just opportunity cost, right? That's all it is. So well, yeah, you're... and in gold, sometimes you really don't want to hesitate and secure it because the cost of gold, depending on how you enter the trade, um. Where's the cost? Uh, I thought I just put commission on. Where's the commission? Oh, this is Meditrader. There's no commission in Meditrader. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. In Darwin, I can show you in Darwin. In Darwin, the commission, let's say we're trading gold here, it is, is 
you know, it's pretty hefty. Mm -hmm. um, these are half lot trades and a six and a quarter a trade. So you're looking at almost thirteen dollars for every lot. That that's pretty steep. Um, I mean, it's just what it is. But I mean, I'm just saying you have to think about that when you're putting on your size. You trade you trade a Brandon candle, and all of a sudden you see a charge of fifty bucks. So holy crap! <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? Because the Brandon candle is two and a half lots. So if I could recap some uh, um, takeaways that you shared with us tonight is one, practice patience by waiting for your setups instead of trading willy-nilly. Um, two, identify what your setups are, high probability setups. Um, have you shared, did you, um, What what's like your favorite setup that you hunt for right now that, that you know when you see it you're going to make money on it any type of breakout um it could be it could, look at this guy his max drawdown is 13 percent. but mm -hmm. look at the amount of return he has over that 13 percent. right i mean it's huge huge even now it's well anyway. so to answer your question um i don't know if i have a diagram for that well, I know you're a momentum trader, so you tra you love trading breakouts. Breakouts are your go is your go to yeah. strategy. Break break right? Breakouts are it, but I might have a. Uh, oh, I know my business plan. Wait, where the heck is it? There it is. Eagle, it, it the commissions are higher for gold than they are for the euro, though. Just so you know. Yeah, you gotta try silver. <laughs> yeah, that's outrageous. You enter the trade sometimes it's three hundred bucks. Come on, what word? Open up here. I think it'll open. Here we go. This top branch here would be my favorite setup. And it's what I call a break hook and go, or you call it a, a bear pullback or a bull pullback. For those of you that know Nate, that's his absolute favorite trade. But what we're looking for here. For instance, here, if it pulls back, that would be the break. Here's the hook, and you, you go. Break, mm -hmm. hook, and go. And, and you could just say, well, it pulled back, stopped, it's ready to go again. That's it. That's a bull pullback. And in this case, here's a bear pullback. Um, same thing. You wait for the break and the go. Up, break, go. That's my favorite trade. Um, so basically, I see M's and W's. Every day. And your one, two, threes, right? <laughs> yeah, every every M has a double uh, double top and every W has a double bottom. Yeah. You and your when they pass the triple zero, top. Zero, two, three, right? Yep. Um, so, yeah. I don't follow the one, two, three so much because I don't think of it that way, but I'm learning. And then they pull back to the 50. I'm still a rookie. <laughs> then, but this is market structure. This is exactly what market structure is, right? Yep. And that's the my favorite breakout. trade. One, two, three, pull back to 50. I'm learning to watch for the 50% a whole lot more often now also. That's another plus I get from your class. Um. And the other way to do this is if we have channels, which we often have these oblique channels. Um, <clears throat> if you were trading this, you would trade it up, have the pullback, and then trade it up again. Have the pullback and trade it up again. It's the same thing as the above. It's just on a diagonal or an oblique, whichever you prefer. Or the same thing when it's going down. Um, you would trade it down. It gets to the edge. You wait. It'll pause there, usually. Wait, see what it's going to do. Bounces back. Okay. You can either trade it back or wait for it to get back and stop and trade it back down again. Uh, and of course, if it breaks the trend line, then I'm in seventh heaven because that's a breakout. And hopefully I can get an outside channel that I can run wide the wave on. So how do you... 
this is something relatively new to your trading. How do you consistently remind yourself to have patience and wait for the better price? Is that a struggle that you're still working through? Or have you found a technique that helps you to remind yourself that you need to do that? Well, it's not per perfect yet, that's for sure. But mm -hmm. I wait for where you see these little circles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you see the break line here. Okay, now it's confirmed. Waiting for the confirmation. That's one of the other points of the class, waiting for confirmation. Oh, my God. Oh. Yep. I am so I am so bad at that. Um, for me, you know, as soon as oh it's coming my way, I'm back in the trade. I don't wait for confirmation. Yeah, that's uh, something we worked on in boot camp. Yeah, and so that's colossally. And then of course, in in the case of this M confirmation, is when it passes the, this breakout line. Boom. Okay, it broke out into the trade. Normally, I'm so impatient. I'm entering a trade up here where you see my little cursor. Um, but I am doing better at it. Um, well, it's a constant. So the battle sometimes within ourselves is the trying to remember that that's what we're working on. Right? And then when we don't do it and we get our hand slapped more or less, then we're like, oh, yeah, I remember I needed to do that. And so that yeah, sometimes I is the battle where we need to try to remind ourselves to do it before we get to the oh yeah <laughs> i should have done that right it's not quite so easy yeah. yeah um i still haven't uh because i'm one of the things i started doing was um trading without my indicator on on <clears throat> mt5 um which forces me to look at the price action more and it also forces me to think of 50%, one, two, threes, a little more. And yeah, where's the market going? What's it doing? Yeah, more, more structure. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. More, I'm going to get a drink here. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, and I love that for you. I really do because um, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to use indicators and I never will say it's a bad thing, but it can reduce our ability to read the market if we're relying upon a tool versus pure price action. Do you know what I mean? Well, and once we can understand what price action is, then we can use indi indicators as a tool um, to help as a confirmation to what we already have seen. The, uh, right? Excuse me, Norma taught me how to use a CCI which I really enjoyed for a good couple of years. Um, one of the things that I did not learn in the industry was adequate sizing or risk protection um, for whatever reason. Uh, at that time in a Freer's life, risk wasn't really taught very much or at all. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I learned to use an indicator also because I didn't understand price cycles and I didn't understand fractals. Um, fractals still get me sometimes, but uh, to help me with the price cycles, I started using the CCI. A reason I use the SMI, which is stochastic momentum index, um, is because it reflects the price action as it is right now, not in the future, mm -hmm. but right now. Um, where is price right now? And where is it in the cycle? Um, and that's one of the reasons I use it. Um, a lot of times I'll have a one hour chart over here and say, where am I in relation to the one hour chart? Well, the one hour chart reflects in the, in the indicator reflects that it's going up. Well, duh, yeah, you can see the price are going up. Also, <clears throat> another, uh, it, clue is the daily and this these these percentages of change starts at close of business New York time. So since that time <clears throat> XAU has gone up 0.33%. Um which is reflected you also uh, use the didn't you also use the um uh, do you rely heavily upon the Dixie? Couldn't think for a second. I used to not so much anymore. Okay. I would I using the DXY 
if I were trading GBV or USD or any of these US mm -hmm. pairs, yeah, then I look at the D DXY. Uh, today was an excellent day to trade the USD, uh, Euro, that's for sure. I mean, the Euro today. Yeah, Bill did awesome. Bill did a great job trading it today. Um, yeah, I mean, look at that. I mean, jeez. Um, what, a, what a run. Boom down, pivot this morning, and boom up. You couldn't ask for a better run. Um, yeah, and I get to secure my night trades now. So good night trades. See yeah, you night. Hopefully you reverse on you in London. <laughs> that does if it does, I've already made a quarter percent. So we're good. But yeah, the DXY is highly correlated, um, <clears throat> obviously with the USD pairs. And these are the only pairs that I track. I don't trade all of them very often. I trade the USD JPY almost every night, because uh, that's what moves in the Asian section. Um, although tonight yeah, they moved pretty well for Duke, but it's still only 0.04 percent. That's not much. Uh, so let me let me ask you let me ask you this: just to somebody that would, um, how would you describe if uh, somebody out there didn't know that they were a momentum trader? Um, how would you describe a momentum trader um, to somebody that's still trying to figure out what type of trade trade trader they are or they align themselves to? What, what, how would you define a momentum trader? Because in my mind, you, you know, you have three types of traders. You have the counter trend, um, the people that don't have a fear of adding to trades and losing position. That's generally counter trend traders. Then you have trend traders who hate being in drawdown and they always want to just get in, have the market move directly into their favor. And then you have momentum traders, which are, um, you're waiting for the breakouts and you're just, you're following momentum. The um, Each one has advantages and disadvantages that we don't need to get into. But if you're a new trader and you're like, well, I don't really know what I like, what would you say? Um, what, what, uh, what are some tips um, that you would say to somebody that's learning how to become a momentum trader? Cause, cause that's what you are and you're, you're a good momentum trader. Most new traders, start with counter trends and why because they're easy to see it sure. is going up boom it changed it's going down gee i can get a three bar reversal i don't have to worry about hangman's or gravestones or dojis or any of that stuff it's just i can see it's going up or it's going down so most new traders like that and then all of a sudden hey i got two in a row i can feel it after you trade a little while and you know this david you learn to feel the pressure in your body the momentum which way you you feel it you just sense it you know it and and that's where new traders learn um now i, I tend to build as much as i don't fade a whole lot anymore but i do build a lot sure. um and, and so here it breaks out boom i start building and i can let it run all the way up that's what, one of the that, one of the best things i learned from trade the fund is trading with no take profit Hey, I would miss, you know, if you're trading with five or 10 pips, you got to keep re-entering. And, you know, on Darwin, that costs money, big money. <laughs> um, that's going to take off on your net profit. Instead of making two pips, you have to make five pips. So just just let, them run. let your let your winners run and cut your right. losers short. And that's something that, again, you do really well at. You, know? well, you cut, took, cut your losers and let your winners run. It took me a long time to get them losers cut. I, I didn't used to do that. But I learned. And I learned again from trade to fund. If you cut them losers short, and then again, you're patient for the next high probability entry point, um, it's so easy to make your money back. Like you might cut it short at 100 bucks. Okay, fine. And then you yep. wait for the next high probability entry, but you just made 500 Unfortunately, and unfortunately, you have to do it in order to believe it. You, you can't, nobody can tell you if you'll make more money if you cut losers. You have to do it in order to believe it. One day right? I was and trading I, and I had a zillion trades on, and some of them were really pretty big losers. I mean, like 500,000 bucks. And I started chopping them off. And as I'm chopping them off, I'm watching my risk score go up instead of down. 
I, man, now this is fantastic. My drawdown is actually improving. I'm not putting another trade on, and I'm cutting. All I'm doing is cutting off losers. Yep. I mean, and that that's it. Okay, I'm in. And honestly, that's what I want for. I would want that for everybody in our community to have the belief that they know that if they cut losers, they'll make more money. And you will absolutely hundred percent. You got you got to let them, give them a little bit of room, but you don't have to give them a whole lot. There's some traders. Uh, one that I read recently, and it was from South Africa. And the the way that it was one of the market wizards, the way they trade, and their hedge fund. They turned around and said, "No, we don't expect the trade. We don't give room for the market to make a decision. We expect the trade to go in our direction right after we enter." It's like people that trade, um, you know, stocks, uh, say small caps. Yeah. They only have a couple cents or a dollar at the most, not even a dollar, ten cents for a stop loss. Could you imagine Forex having a ten cent stop loss? Huh. But if you have a one dollar or ten dollar stop loss, depending on the pair and blah blah blah, it's the same thing. Yeah. So. I, I yeah I couldn't stress that more. You know I guess we have a fifty fifth stop loss automatically built into Anubis. Yeah, I don't I don't ever, I, I I haven't hit my stop loss in so long. I don't. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, that same way. I only hit my stop loss when I secure my trades. But you can't say that. Yeah, well only once. <laughs> <or twice. laughs> yes, and I should have secured tonight, but oh well. You should have. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I thought of it after the fact, but at least I thought of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anybody does anybody um have any uh? Oh, I was just going to say anybody have questions. That Steve just said, "How many layers deep do you begin thinking about cutting your losers?" Um, Ed doesn't really do that. Uh, he's the momentum. So once the momentum stops and it goes the other way, he's out. Yeah, he's momentum traded. So he doesn't he doesn't view it in terms of zones and layers because he doesn't build into a position. He waits for the momentum, jumps into the momentum. Once the momentum is either confirmed or rejected, he gets out. Yeah. So it's it's not like a he's not playing a range or a trend. He's playing the breakouts of the ranges. Yeah. So okay. What confirms uh the confirmation of momentum changing. It, it might pause. It, yeah, a rejection. Yeah, uh, it could be a couple of candles direction. going the other way. It'd say two candles. Well, that's almost a three bar reversal. I'm out. Okay. Um, I just didn't. I mean, I always hear this. We need to wait for confirmation, but I really don't know what the confirmation is. <laughs> well, a three bar reversal is a pretty good con confirmation. But sometimes, you know, you see these bars on here. Some of these bars are pretty big. Yeah. Um, you know, I might not wait a whole bar. <laughs> um, if I uh, let me see here, you can see I don't. You can probably see the trade here. I took a lot of trades up here. Um, my history. See, there's a bunch of losers there. I closed them out because I didn't like it. There's a couple. There's a couple grand right there. It was not. It was not a happy camper. It wasn't going my way. And you do really do need to think of this in terms of Steve. That if you're not a momentum trader, um, he basically Ed's looking for ride the wave, um, opportunities. That's what he's looking yeah, for. that's my favorite. Right, well, that's what he's hunting for. And I've when you when you say wait that. for confirmation, there's so many, so many styles of trading, and each style has its own. So I just want to make sure that you're not pigeoning pigeoning waiting for confirmation yeah you have just to trade what thing, fits your right? personality right exactly uh, my personality used to be i didn't know any better when i was first learning um obviously um what am i doing i'm looking for a different account i was going to show you my trade from this morning um uh i think it was in this one steve did you have something else you were going to say i didn't mean to cut you off no, no, no. Oh, well, I was just saying that I'm slowly since I, I I went trying to do your uh, one lot 
challenge on a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar account, I think I'm gravitating more towards momentum than I am towards uh, fading. Sure. I seem to get into a lot more trouble fading and I get three or four layers deep. And like yesterday. Uh, yeah. Well, especially if you're dealing, if, yeah. if, if you're trading with one lot, you can't fade very deep. Right. So position size is king. And so if you're trading with one lot, you do well, need one, to catch one your runners. Size account. 100K, I'm sure. Yeah, it's the Darwin account. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can fade or build. I. I mean, I. I don't. I look at my my own view of trading is I look at everything as a swing trade. It doesn't matter if I'm on a one minute chart or a one hour chart. To me, it's a swing trade. You go from KPI to KPI. Um, I'm trying to find my account from this morning. Which one was that? Twenty eight thirty. That was in part two. Um. But I, I look at everything as a swing trade. I and I can find the chart for you that Sean did actually, because they're really good. Uh forex folders. Uh, thought I had a label here for Sean. Yes, I don't. Okay. I apologize. Maybe they're in here. Uh, not in there. Well, yeah, it was there. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Here, Sean was teaching us about, uh, Well, it was his wobble, but this is just a, a swing trade. He puts his lines on, but it's like the same thing we do in class or David does. They put the lines on, and it's a swing, pivot to pivot, pivot to pivot. How many price cycles between pivots? In this case, we got at least two price cycles. The same thing comes back, two price cycles. One up, one and a quarter down. One up, two down. It's just swing. I look at it all as swing trades. It doesn't matter what time frame I'm on. Um, and and um, yeah, this is a, this is going sideways to me. That is a no trade zone. Why? Because it's not telling me anything. There's no information here except that it's going sideways. Which the market does more times than not, especially depending on your time frame. As a momentum trader, I have to wait for it to break out. It has to tell me which way it's going to go. And if it's heading south, okay. And the daily trend is south, I look for alignment if I can. I'll build into south trades. If it goes north, I'll build into a north trade. Um, but it's still it's a swing. I'm swinging between whichever way it broke. I'm going to swing. Uh, here's the higher time frame. So if it broke south. I'm going to try and swing down to this level. If I broke north, I'm going to try and swing up to this level. Is, is that kind of make a little sense? Yes. Are we still here? Yep. No. So, uh, spicy nexus. It's really interesting. And uh, thanks for sharing your view and on, on things. So. And that's, that's exactly what we want tonight, right? It's just like, hey, um, Ed's had some very powerful aha moments just recently, and he's shared those with me, and we've gotten to trade together here recently quite a bit. And um, some of us got I, to trade. Some of us got I, to listen. I love, um, I love seeing your journey, your trading journey. You know, I've obviously have I haven't traded with you very much during the apiary days, but I. I've known, you know, I've seen you and I've, we've talked and communicated and all that, but, um, your journey has been, I, I feel like you have unlocked your trading, um, or leveled up, I should say just recently in the last six months from what, from what you've been doing. So well, I'd say I'd even narrow the time frame down more than that. 
a little bit less than that. Yeah, so here was here 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 was what I did today. The one six six was Darwin, and these were my other three accounts. The total was eighteen two. But if it were or real money, which it all isn't, obviously, that'd be a twenty grand day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta I could, love I those. Live with that. <laughs> well, then do it. That's yeah, it. I'm Just do it. it. <laughs> the, 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 the challenge the challenge is believe it or not is patience yes it is That's that is ultimate challenge. and that, that and that goes with every everybody that it's whatever style you are is is just um sometimes we're very impatient with our own trading right you know i all I, right I, I trade with duke every night that i can and i i try to shut up so i don't distract him um and i don't even trade always trade the same pair um but it's nice to be able to trade with somebody that's why I've, i trade within the classes in the morning i don't ever just sit there and don't trade but i do trade less because i'm you know i used to pay 500 trades in a day was not an issue now i don't make 50 trades in a day in fact i don't think i make 20. yeah that's a really is a really really stark contrast of where you where you where you were and where you've been and where you're going. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So, Ed, am I a younger version of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a few years ago, Duke. Uh, and maybe one of the things is the fact that <clears throat> I'm getting a little older, and I decided to slow down a little bit. One of the other things I do before I start trading in the morning, I'll actually set and you can call it meditation but i'll be quiet for five or ten minutes um just settle just be quiet you know i get up do my little deals and i'd be quiet when i'm done trading aside from doing my stats i get done and i get out and i go exercise i mean trading isn't just a hit the enter button trading is a lifestyle you got and, yeah. and anything you do you got to stay in shape hopefully eat properly and as Brandon can tell you time and time again, get enough sleep. Yep. But when you start, you need to start calm. You can't start in a rush. Um, and five minutes or 10 minutes of being quiet or meditating, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you're religious, sit there and pray. I don't care. Um, but that way, at least you're starting with your both feet on the ground and level and looking at price action. Where is the structure? And like I got Duke's chart, Duke's chart on here. Um, I mean, good gosh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that's what your chart used to look like, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not chastising you, Duke, but I mean, holy smokes. Um, but some people got <laughs> so many indicators on there, you can't read the little on thing at all. Yeah. I don't know how they trade it. But anyway. Good trading, Duke. You had a positive day again as usual. Duke's number one on our leaderboard. In case any, oh, no, he's not either. He moved back. Um, I moved back. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you you taking the time to share with us tonight. Um, hopefully, everybody here who uh, listened to you is like, um, had some golden nuggets that you can take away. And again, I don't. I wanted to really dig into what patience means, right? And even though it can mean a little bit different for you and and everybody else, um, sometimes we just take the as as instructors, I'd say. Sometimes, and I'm and I'm guilty of this, and just making a blanket statement that, like, hey, to trade better, you gotta have patience. Well, what does that mean, right? And so I really wanted to to, to kind of define what that is um, and not just have those blanket statements. To trade better, you got to cut your losses. Well, what does that mean, right? And then get a little granular. And so, Ed, I appreciate I you taking the time to um, sharing what, what you've learned and here just recently. And um, I know that you're still working on things, but um, by sharing – it's going to hold you more accountable and it'll keep you top of mind. Now um, you need to do another one of these. Once you figure out that uh, securing your trades, make you more money, just like cutting your losses will make you more money. So once you, once you incorporate the secured trade, 
then you need to let me know that uh, you're you're on your way to to knocking it out of the park for sure. So, <laughs> if I had to define patience, I, I'd have to say it's waiting for the high probability trade. Once you see it, define your exit and take it. Yep. It's it's um yeah waiting for that setup that 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 you are confident about right. So, and you know if you're not confident and you're just starting out, then pick a pick some a high probability setup, an M a W a breakout, whatever it is, right? But um, speaking of getting sleep, I need to get some sleep because I didn't get any last night and I'm exhausted. So. You know, if I want to trade in the morning, I need to get, I need to hit the the, the pillow. So um, I appreciate you, Ed, and uh, everybody else for hanging around. And we will um, close up here and we'll see you guys tomorrow. So thank you guys. And, Thanks for uh, letting we'll me talk. If the... anybody has any questions, feel free to DM me. Yeah. And we'll see you bright and ugly for um, Pete's boot camp in the morning. So Absolutely. thanks, guys. And we'll see you in the morning. Okay, Dave. Thank you.